Okay, greetings. Uh, first of all, latest news from Burgundy is that the harvest started uh, last week, um, early-ish last, probably about Wednesday for most people in the Cote de or for a number of people in the Cote de Bain, the early people. Um, others started this weekend. The weather has stayed pretty good. A little bit of rain on Tuesday. There's a few showers forecast for coming up, but it won't be enough to uh, derail the quality of what we have. And it's a nice, um, nice size crop, uh, 40, 40 hectoliters a hectare in, in uh, red and 50 in white, probably. So that's, it's not as big as 17 reds or 18 whites, but, but it's a good healthy size, which uh, will um, fill up the barrel cellars, which is good. And it looks as though the wines will be uh, pretty good and uh, the alcoholic degrees, the sugar levels haven't got too high. Um, and uh, there's no disease of any sort or virtually none. And um, yeah, it's encouraging at any rate. So that's news at the moment. And I'll probably go on for another uh, week or so, the harvest or a bit longer in the Cote de Marie. Right, today's subject is uh, the Grand Cru Charme Chambertin, um, which is often slightly devalued because there's so much of it. There's 18 hectares, which can call themselves um, uh, which are pure Charme Chambertin, but a total of 30 hectares, which can be called Charme Chambertin, because there are 12 hectares of Mesoyer uh, Chambertin, which can go either under its own name or under the name of Charme Chambertin. And most people, a lot of people who've got both will put them together as Charme. Uh, even people who've only got Mesoyer will quite often sell it as Charme. It's a sort of sexier, more interesting name. Every village has got a charm of one sort or another. I mean, uh, in Pirinia Marche, there's a village vineyard called Charm. In Merceau, it's a premier crew, um, Chambre Misni Le Charm, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just in Chevry Chambertin that the vineyard called Charm has got to be a Grand Cru. Um, we don't know, rather frustratingly, the origin of this name, uh, uh, which we ought to know since it's in every village. Um, there are various different theories. One is that they used to have uh, hornbeam trees, which are charmi in French, um, planted in the area. One is that it's a corruption of a, uh, another word for rock, um, but I doubt if that's the case. I would like to believe that they were called charm, all these vineyards, simply because the wines are so charming, but I don't think that can work historically because in those days people didn't separate out, make separate cubes. But it's pretty much the case that Sham, wherever it is in a uh, village, is on the lower part of the slope and uh, with a certain amount of topsoil and tends to give softer, more generous wines um, compared to vineyards which are closer to the rock. And that is the case of Sham Chambata. And it, it is, I think, a mistake that they have allowed people to put Sham and uh, uh, Masoya together because the wines of Masoya tend to be quite different. The topsoil is different, it's a lighter color in Masoya and there are more stones near the surface. Sham, it's a slightly richer, redder soil, uh, which would indicate a little bit about a, <coughs> a little bit of iron oxide in the soil to give that red color. Um, <clears throat> another reason why Sham has been a little bit devalued is if you count the two vineyards together. There is a section in Mesoyer which goes right down to the main road, which other Grand Cru's apart from Claude Rougeau don't do. Um, and there's a view that maybe somebody got greedy and added that bit when it can't be as good. But actually, if you look at the geology, you will see that the geology there is very similar to the rest of it, um, which is not true of other bits that go down to the main road. Uh, just a sort of freak of geology. But as it happens, our three producers today all have Charme Chambertin in the Charme path. And I'm just going to try and share my screen, but it often hasn't worked in the past. Uh, I don't have enough bandwidth or something like that. Uh, and I've also got to find the document which I want, which currently I'm not seeing. Um, so I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, if not, I can send it through to you afterwards. But um, I have succeeded in working out the exact plots of our three producers um, today. So if I can get that to you in a second, I shall. Even while I'm talking, I'm just playing around with things behind the scene. So they're not the biggest producers uh, in Sham because the biggest of all is frankly indifferent, which is domain of Camus, Hubert Camus. Um, the only saving grace about it is that almost all the grapes these days 
are sold on to aspiring negotiants, I mean, some of the big names, but also um, some of the <coughs> uh, exciting sort of smaller scale um, negotiants. Now, can you see a map there? Or are you still seeing me? You can see the map. You can see the map. Right. Can you see it in enough detail to make any sense? Yep. Yes. Yep. Good. yes. Okay, so I've written in, if we look at the map, at the bottom of your screen is the border with Masriere Chambertin. So we're actually starting in the north and going south. On the left is uphill, and uh, where you can see lots of very small uh, stripes, um, that becomes uh, Chambertin itself. The two big blocks are, are Camus blocks. On the extreme right, you're, get, you're down to village vineyards. And this is about two thirds of what is the Sham part of Sham Chambertin. And you can see near the border with Masoyer, there is a block of um, Denis Bachelet. Anything in red is what we're having today. Anything that's in blue are other interesting producers who are next door. Then there must have been the Dugas family must have had a big block, which has sub subsequently got divided. So there's uh, three small blocks making up Dugas P's holding and three slightly bigger blocks for um, Claude Dugas. I left in uh, Seraphim because next door to Bachelet, as I like Seraphim's wines. Then there is a narrow lane, and you go over um, that lane to Joseph Roti, who's lower in the slope. That's his main block. And then you can see higher up, there are two more low on the slope blocks belonging to Bachelet and Roti. Um, so that just gives you an idea of uh, how everything gets divided up in Burgundy, and also the fact that by chance, our three producers are for the most part. Uh, close to each other. So once we got the wines together, the way the tasting breaks down is um, naturally is to look at, um, first of all, the four younger vintages from Denis Bachelet. So we'll talk about him in detail. Then we've got um, the same two vintages, 05 and 10, uh, for Roti and Dugas, and I'll talk about those two domains there. And then I will leave you in peace to enjoy the older vintages uh, from a mixture of Bachelet and Roti, 02 back to 91. So um, <clears throat> first of all, Denis Bachelet, he was one of the very, very, very first producers uh, that I bought from in Burgundy. I bought his 1981 Charme Chambertin, which is a ridiculously <laughs> indifferent vintage for most people. And Denis was aged 17 at the time, so he was born late in 1963. Um, and uh, his grandfather had died in 1979. His father was living mostly in Belgium, but then he sort of came over and did the harvest. And a 17 year old, begin his luck maybe, made extraordinarily good wine in that very wet and difficult vintage. And it became an absolute favorite of mine. So I bought the 81, the 82 and the 83. The 83 subsequently got sent back by our customers because it was a year that was sort of full of rot that wasn't all that obvious in the barrel tasting but became obvious early on in the bottle. So most of it got sent back to us and we refunded our customers. And there was a case of Charme Chambertin that nothing really happened with and obviously had no value as it had been rejected. So I annexed it to myself and it took about 20 years and it became absolutely lovely wine. I've either got one bottle or none left um, now, but for some, in some inexplicable way, it managed to eat up um, the rot, which was seemed to be so prevalent in the wine, and the fruit just took over. Uh, the DRC wines were criticized for having rot, and, and they turned themselves around. And also Armand Russo, one of his importers in the UK, rejected the whole allocation, sent it back, uh, or possibly didn't even take it. Um, you know, we're forgiven for that, and we're allowed to have wines thereafter. Uh, but uh, again, when I've had an 83 Russo since, somehow or other, it seems to have come round, uh, which is comforting. I'm not saying that in any of those three domains, it is the ideal vintage for them, but um, it was just a surprise that something that was quite so rotten could become good. Because if you go back that far, nobody had sorting tables and everybody just accepted whatever fruit they got as being the fruit of the vintage. And so you would make the wine with it uh, rather than saying, okay, well, we'll separate out the good bits and throw away the bad bits. Um, that really didn't change. It ch started changing during the 90s, and it was already in, at the end of the 90s that the majority of good demands had sourcing tables. 
Um, anyway, that's a, a, a diversion. And then um, the rest of the 80s, Denny was, and into the 90s, Denny was making really beautiful wines. Um, they got a little bit less good for a couple of vintages when his, uh, his first marriage broke up. Um, the rest of the 90s then became very strong. Um, the style changed a little bit in the 2000s um, for two reasons, I think. One is, as we started to get into a period when the yields were uh, smaller than they used to be, uh, partly through climatic um, incidents, um, Denny, I think, perhaps maybe extracted a little bit more um, uh, juice when pressing, for example, um, in order to up the volumes. And the wines just became a little bit firmer, a little bit more tannic, took longer to come round. And there was then a little bit of a blip that began in 2009, was all subsequent vintages were less affected, but maybe through to 2013, you have a, an element of it when he got a bad batch of barrels from um, his regular um, barrel cooper. Uh, and there are some off flavors, particularly in the O9s, which may or may not get eaten up as the fruit develops further. It may be the same story as in the rock, but um, I occasionally um, try an O9 just to see, but at the moment they're still showing it. Much less apparent in the 10, it's a little bit present in 11 and probably fading by 12 and 13. Um, and it is entirely attributable to bad barrels. In due course, he got rid of those barrels. Um, and thereafter, he's now been joined by his son, Nicolas, who's a great guy. Um, and the wines, I think, are back in a really good place. And they've gone back to being a little bit juicier um, and, uh, and, and sort of more fruit friendly, um, even in their youth. So we're going to have just one wine from after that little interregnum, 2016, and then you've got three vintages from shortly before, which I think are all too young. Um, I mean, I used to get uh, some of all his wines every year. Nowadays, I just get a case each of the Bourgogne and the Chevre, but even the Bourgogne Rouge from 2005, 2007, I think is probably too young to drink. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how the bottles which have traveled to you of the Cham Chambetin are showing. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the um, vineyard that he has, but have you got, do you have all four in front of you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you started tasting? If not, please do. Taste away. Um, I would have a sort of very quick taste of the four and then go back in and, uh, and spend more time with each of them. So the bottles of almost all his cuvées, and it's genuine in each case, are labelled as Bievin, and the Charm Chambertin is uh, one of the oldest. The younger vines are planted in the 1920s, and there are some vines going back to the 19th century. Um, All, all these producers have got brilliantly old vines uh, in their Charm Chambertin plots. Oh, I've got my sheet of paper that, that reminds me what vintages you're drinking. Here we are. So 2016, you'll remember uh, the year of the frost um, and only one village really got spared, which was Moray Saint-Denis. Um, lucky people but uh, uh, otherwise pretty much everybody got uh, got clobbered um, and uh, it didn't affect in the reds I don't think that it affected the quality uh, but it did affect the the volume obviously and I remember it was it was pretty grim at the time going into people's cellars and just seeing a couple of barrels where five or ten would normally be and um, it's going to be the same with 2021, which I'm going to start tasting in detail next month. Um, of our three producers, Denny has the biggest holding of Charm Chambertin. It's still not enormous. He's got 0.43 um, of a hectare, which at a Grand Cru level might mean six, um, six barrels a year, um, absolute maximum eight, but probably more like five or six in, in most vintages. 
Um, I'm just going to see if I've got a tasting note on the on his wine. Um, I won't have tasted any of these ultra recently, um, so it'll be interesting to get your feedback. Just having a look to see if I've if I've got a note on my site about um, 2016. Um, I should have done somewhere. Uh, any feedback from from you? How it's showing today? Sixteen shows that the change in style that you mentioned, Jasper. There's much there's, there's much more sort of sumptuous fruit, uh, yeah. especially like the O8, which is obviously a bit more sort of leaner, leaner, and um, probably a bit more black fruit. It's very plush. But mm -hmm. you know, I absolutely love it. But it's that six, sixteen shining through in it. Yes, um, I think the change in, 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 in Cooper, it's not just that he got let down by uh, the person who messed up the 2009 vintage, but what's also true to say is that uh, his new Coopers are amongst the best, uh, whereas the previous person wasn't. So he gets a bit from Rousseau the Cooper, uh, who are distant cousins, if at all, of, of the uh, wine growing Rousseaus. And he gets some from Chassin, who's who's deeply trendy, and um, that is one other um, whose name currently is uh, Raymond, who is who um, uh, Catiar uses a lot of. Um, the wines used to be very much black fruit, but with such a sumptuous energy, I can't at the moment find a tasting note on the 2016, but um, never mind. Um, but um, uh, I'm glad to see that he, he's, he's right back uh, where he ought to be. So then you've got 07, 08 and 05. We look at eight and seven together as a pair because they're both not considered in the first rank um, uh, vintages, which made nice wines. Eight, typically very pure, very clean, very Pinot, but lacking a bit of generosity. Um, I liked it when I last tasted it uh, November 2013 as part of a Bachelet Chambre Chambertin vertical, um, put on by your esteemed colleague Richard, who I think is not with you today. Um, and uh, the 08 um, score, scored 92 with three stars. And I said very pure, very classic, uh, intense raspberry fruit, not too dark. But, um, it was all about the elegance and the stylish, and I felt that it would be ready in the medium term. Um, the 07 was a bit more generous, was a bit more forward. Um, the oak was a bit prominent then, um, but it, I felt in 2013 that it was approachable soon. Um, so I'm expecting that to be not quite so powerful, but with um, still, um, yeah, it should, it should be in a good place now. Any views on 08 and 07? Seven's quite sort of broad shouldered for an 07. Like you said, it's um surprisingly still that it's drinking, but it's got a lot of years ahead of it. While I think the 08 still needs a little bit of time to unfurl a little bit. I do actually think the 08 would be exceptional. Um yeah. the, the but the 07 is surprisingly, you know, there's still a fair bit of muscle there. They're both vintages which are sort of coming more into favour now that we've had all these hot rich years when people want something which is more reminiscent of what they felt Burgundy used to be like, uh, then, then eight and seven are more in that camp. Uh, instead, you're not tasting it today, but uh, the 2006 was, I don't think you're tasting it, are you? No, you're not. Uh, I thought the 2006 was, was very successful uh, from, from Denny. Uh, and then we have the 05, um, which I imagine is still incredibly backward. Uh, it showed very well indeed at the vertical tasting in 2013, but was so useful then. Um, and, you know, we kept going back to it and, and watching it not yet develop, um, which is pretty much characteristic of 2005s. I still think if you've got them in your cellar, you're much better off holding them for the medium or even long term future. Uh, so how is the 05 today? Pretty, good, pretty yeah. tight, so it's not opening up much. Yeah, but does it indicate that it, it's really got the depth and concentration for the long term? I hope it does. Slightly coiled is in my <laughs> nose. Slightly <laughs> coiled, there you go. Yeah, I mean, you know, that is typically my, my experience. And 
Look, even the Bourgogne Rouge wines that I bought in 2005, most of those are still alive and kicking at 17 years old. Um, and I bought pretty widely in that vintage, and I'm just not especially tempted to um, drink them yet. Um, but I, I feel the same way about 99 and 96. I'm still keeping those. On the other hand, I am English, and other, <laughs> other taste, tastes do apply. J Jasper, I tasted the 05. I was expecting more concentration of fruit than I got. I agree with the guys that it's tightly coiled, but it doesn't, for me, have that tightly snugly. You know it's all there, but it doesn't have that concentration of fruit that I expected from an 05. I mean, it's in the period when he was making wines that were a bit leaner and tighter and less sumptuous, uh, but I'd be surprised if uh, the fruit doesn't emerge. Um, when you come to the 2002, um, later on, you've got a couple of those. Um, it's a vintage which I, I believed in. I thought it was sort of like maybe a cross between 2008, 2010. But it was on the lean side until suddenly the moment came when it decided it was mature and ready to drink. And so, suddenly you found a level of velvet in the wine that hadn't been there before. And that's my belief that will happen with almost all O5s, and I'm hoping will be the case for the Bachelet, but as I'm not tasting it with you, um, then I can't actually, you know, give an opinion on how the wine is showing uh, for you today. Jasper, you did mention, what change did he make in his winemaking? I know he changed the, the barrels, the Cooper, but what, what change happened between O5 and 16? I think that he st started consciously trying to extract the wines less. Uh, less punching down, uh, maybe less sort of aggressive pressing of the um, of the solids at the end of the fermentation. Um, incidentally, I haven't said, uh, but uh, the wines are completely destemmed. Um, all his, uh, all three of our producers uh, today are destemmers 100%. Um, so it's, it's to do with the extraction and or uh, uh, the pressing. Is the main part of it. I and mean, whenever I've been there at the harvest, uh, they're gorgeous looking grapes and small berries and small individual grapes. So you're going to get quite a lot of solid to, to, to juice ratio. Um, and I think it's better if you just have a lighter hand. So um, Alain Berger used to be sort of the, the poster boy for very tightly extracted wines. And uh, more recently, that domain, the wines have become much looser and softer. And Denny Bachelet was very fruit forward, softer wines, and he, he rather went the other way. These wines would benefit from at least some stems being added. Um, I think the producers have got to feel comfortable with that. Um, he's not a noticeably late picker, and it's the late picking people who I think really need to have stems in their wines. Um, I think um, now the wines have been opened uh, well in advance, but they won't have been decanted in, in Burgundian fashion. And if you were to serve this wine at home or have it in a restaurant, then I would go against the, uh, the standard advice not to decant red burgundy. I think that 05, I would uh, probably decant. But ideally, I just wouldn't drink it for another five and probably 10 years. Okie doke. All happy? So um, in terms of pleasure, it sounds as though the 16 is the one that's giving most pleasure. Um, would that be right? Yeah, it's the most, it's the most ready to drink. I mean, like the nose and the fall, yeah. like it's, it's there. Like it's, it's surprisingly it's just lucky. Just, yeah, it's it's sexy sexy and just easier to drink. Well, uh, in that case, enjoy. It pro it's very possible it will close up. Uh, at a later date, um, but uh, non non nonetheless, I mean, it is an indication of uh, of a, a slight, and I think probably welcome change in style. Um, I mean, Denny's wines used to be accessible reasonably early, um, and once you made in the eighties and um, much of the nineties, they would still keep very well, um, but uh, but they were accessible early, and it was only late nineties. And into the 2000s that I felt that um, they really needed keeping in order to show their best merit. Uh, later on, I won't be staying with you all the way through. Um, I have to go and get another vaccination. Um, 
we'll leave in about half an hour. Um, and, uh, uh, but when you get to the older wines, um, 2002, I think should be ready. 1996, what I find with this vintage is it often shows a fraction of oxidation when you first op open it, which then blows off. Um, and that could be in a very good place. 93 should be absolutely lovely. And 91, a rare sighting of 1991, um, because that again was a big, badly frosted vintage. I haven't tasted the 91 for the longest time, so I, I don't have a memory of, of where that is, um, unless Richard brought it for our vertical, but I don't think he did. Um, okay, so let's talk about the other two uh, producers. You're gonna taste 10 and five, so two great classic uh, vintages, 10 so suave and silky and uh, enjoyable young. Um, and actually, in many instances, I think beginning to reach, if not full maturity, but 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 heading in that direction, and then uh, two more O fives. Um, <clears throat> so you can compare and contrast with your Bachelet O five, which would be really interesting. So Claude Dugas and Joseph Broti. Um, Dugas, I'll start with. It's the domain I know least. Um, I go there and taste from time to time. They're not on my regular list. Um, so uh, uh, the really the person, I mean, the Dugas have been around for a long time. And actually, they are one of the families which have preserved very good vine material. So whether it's Dugas P or Claude Dugas, um, you get these lovely small bunches with tiny grapes. Um, but uh, something Claude Dugas said to me once is that uh, uh, he wants just as many bunches as uh, a greedy neighbor, but uh, he wants to have half the total amount of fruit just small bunches of perfect grapes. Um, so anyway, uh, they 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 uh, operate out of a wonderful old stone building called the Cellier des Dimes, which was um, built in 1219. So whatever, 800 plus years ago. Um, and some parts of it may be a lot older than that. And uh, anyway, um, Claude Dugas' father, Maurice, bought that in 1955 and they've been established there since. Claude is now retired, and uh, the next generation, um, his son Bertrand, with his sisters, uh, have taken over. And they <clears throat> they do also a few negotiable wines but under a completely different uh, label. Um, it's a small domain anyway, and uh, it has three Grand Cru's with only tiny amounts. Minuscule amount of Chapelle Chambertin, Griot Chambertin, uh, and then 0.31 of a hectare, nearly a third of a hectare of the Charme. Um, I think all three of our growers are probably putting the Champ Chambertin 100% into new wood. It's the case here, usually the case at Roti, and if not completely, then at least um, the great majority of the barrels at Bachelet would be new wood each year. Um, it's destemmed again. Um, and uh, I mean, this is a this is a super uh, uh, estate, which um, I'm glad you've got a couple, but you uh, bottles, but you don't see it around very much uh, at all at all. So uh, then we have alongside that um, Joseph Roti. I went once to taste there when Joseph himself, who really is the the family, been around for a while, but he was really the creator who put the domain on the map, established it. Uh, so they're now uh, half in Chauvry Champetain, half in Marcinet. And the only appointment he would give me was at six o'clock uh, in the evening. And I got out about quarter past midnight in the end. Um, and though I was trying to spit things out, uh, our, our host was very definitely not. Um, unfortunately, it did after a while affect his health and he died young in 2008. And very sadly, um, his elder son, Philippe, died shortly afterwards uh, of an uh, unpleasant cancer. And so it's the youngest um, uh, son, um, Pierre Jean, who now makes the wines, assisted by his wife, his mother, his sister, uh, doubtless his children in due course. It remains absolutely a family um, business. And I'm sure there have been a few evolu evolutions and modernizations, but the core is still to do it the way that Joseph Roti did it. Um, and you know they're not they're not looking at every. Uh, latest trend, um, though you know they are pretty keen to uh, improve steadily um, what they're doing in the vineyards, um, and it's it's more in the winemaking where they stay as they were. 
They managed to keep old vines alive. Their Chambre Chambertin should be labeled Très Vieux Vine, very old vines. And uh, basically it was planted in 1881. So uh, he's up there with the um, Merceau Sève du Clos from Arnau Ant and the uh, more than centenary Moulin Vent of Thibault Ligier Belair as just about the oldest vines that I know of from, from Burgundy. So 140 years old now, uh, which is pretty extraordinary. Jasper? Yeah. When you look at the wines, uh, the, the, the Claude Pire looks a lot older. And does it? Taste, it does, noticeably for me. It's just a dark, a deeper color, and it's almost murky. But when you taste it, it's 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 more acidic. And I'm seeing a lot of acidity and sourness on the ten than I would expect for uh, again for ten. I would expect it to be just a cleaner, brighter fruit. Is it just the way he makes his wines? What you're saying is isn't what I would expect. Um, he does have dark color uh, wines typically. But I would expect something as recent as that to be fresher and juicier. And it's not a vintage which normally shows a vast acidity. Uh, do you have Sebastian there with you today? Yeah. 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 Sebastian, uh, what did you think? Did you taste the wine? What do you think? Through the roti has a lot more like flesh of fruit and it's noticeably juicier where the dugat is, you get a lot more. Is it? It's a, it's a drier. On the palate, it's much, it is much drier. I'm not sure if it's. I think it's stylistic more so than there might be a little bottle, a little effect to the bottle, but I think it's more stylistic. Yeah. Yes, I mean, you can get something which is not, strictly speaking, a, you know, a definable fault, but is a bottle that is not showing as well as you would like. I would anticipate um, uh, a better result than that from that wine. It doesn't, it's not sounding like how I'd expect it to be. They are a reasonably extractive domain, and so is Roti. Roti is definitely making wines for the long term. But I think there is normally such a depth of fruit in the Roti wines that they can handle um, the level of extraction. Um, what about, so, so clearly a thumbs up for the Roti over the Dugar in 2010. What's your impression in 2005? Mm -hmm. interesting to see if either of them is any more generous than the Bachelet wine was. I think stylistically the 05 Dugat is similar to the 10. I just think it, it, the, the 10 is again in that stage where it's probably not showing, uh, you know, the, the, the fruit. It, the fruit is hidden at the moment, I'm just going through that slightly numb stage. Please. Yes. Um, in the early days of the well known 10 year on tastings that Clive Coates and Becky Wasserman used to organise, we didn't have the Claude Dugar wines, we had the Dugar P wines, and I used to find them over extracted in a way that made them seem dried out, a bit ugly. And if you do over extract, you can get a form of pinched acidity. Um, and our Dugar P has progressed from there uh, more recently for sure. Um, and I don't have enough experience of the Claude Dugar wines um, to sort of suggest that the same might have been happening. Um, but it, so it sounds as though uh, of, of our three producers today that um, he's slightly disappointed compared to the others. I have to say I like the Denny Bachelet wine sub the ones I've tasted so far. Right. Um, it'll be really interesting to see the older, older Joe Roti wines uh, um, uh, when you get on to those uh, a little bit later on. Um, I've found, I've only started tasting there consistently over the last three years, and I find the wines very intense, very backward, um, but I, I have always felt that there's been enough generosity of fruit to, uh, to show through. It's a lovely old-fashioned style of tasting, because at some point mum will come in with a plate of uh, um, gougere, warmed up gougere for us to enjoy, and then sister will sort of poke her head around the doors, make sure everything's going well. Um, but as I say, uh, I, I need to get back and, and get Claude Dugar back on my uh, uh, established annual visits. May not be easy this year with the 21 vintage. Um, so the two 2010s compared to the two 2005s, do they seem to be, well, um, that, that bit more advanced, readier, uh, and a bit more succulent? And is, are the 05s 
as backward as Denis Bachelet, or are they a little bit more open? If you give them blind, you're looking at, you tasted them just that, looking at the color. The, the fives uh, taste, look, and smell younger. Yeah. I think a tasting would be fun to do. I've done it a couple of times, and it is steadily um, confirming a view for me, is to get the same, uh, do a tasting in which you've got pairs of wines, the nine and the ten, alongside each other and see how those two vintages come out because it's been fashionable to prefer 10 to 9 but I think 10s are reaching their good drinking point and in some cases I felt that they probably don't have that much more to deliver it's not they'll fall over quickly but we're getting to the point at which you can see everything they have to offer whereas nines um, which were very succulent to begin with because it was a rich warm sunny year but they're built around a massive block of granitic tenons. And then the tenons took over and really closed down the nines. Some are still closed, some are opening up. But when you have the two side by side, I think you can see a power and a depth in 09, which is going to keep those wines going for another 10, 15, 25 years. And tens, though probably more enjoyable now, uh, I think are, are getting to the, the plateau when they're good to drink. Um, uh, or indeed, uh, put the fives in as well. But uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't waste the bottles of fives. I would I'd keep them back for longer. Um, does the way I've described sort of the roti style is that coming across in the wines? Yes. It sounded like a, a hesitant yes, but uh, uh, it's a very interesting uh, floral note on, on the aromatics on the O5 roti. Yeah. Really it's flamboyant. really flamboyant. The, the other two are slightly more reserved. The O5 Rote is a bit, the more, uh, bit more flamboyant. Yes. Um, is that the effect of, of truly ancient uh, vines? Uh, uh, I don't know. It could be. Um, I mean, obviously, not every vine is back to 1881 because there will have been replacements for dead vines. But that's when the plot was originally uh, planted replanted uh, post phylloxera and it hasn't been there's been no wholesale planting since then right. so, um yeah so that that's sort of about right um yeah um he goes for he goes for a lot of um the punching down which is uh let people have moved away from in these warm yeah. years um but that's what what sort of builds some of the power behind the wines and the extract but um, as I say, I think uh, I, I think it works, and if that flamboyance is there, uh, uh, all to the good. Uh, Jasper, are any of them biodynamic? Uh, no. Um, uh, I have a feeling that one of them. I think at um, Claude Dugas, he made some experiments in that direction, and then decided he didn't really want to sort of continue all the way through. Um, Denny is not certified organic, but and um, may retain the right for the occasional treatment. But the the vines are really meticulously looked after. He's one of those domains where he he and his wife and son and the team they're out there in the vineyards as much as they uh, possibly can be. Um, Roti, I'm not uh, sure what their practice is, but I don't think that they are. Um, certified for anything. I, 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 would, I wouldn't criticize the farming of, of any of the three. I think they're, they're all amongst the really serious people. Good. Um, well, that's the first eight wines. You have eight more uh, to enjoy, which I will leave you in a few minutes uh, to do so. Um, I, 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 because most of them, if not all of them, almost all of them are repeat vintages in which you've got Bachelet, I've covered 02, 96, 93, 91. Roti, you've got 93 and 91. And I'll be really fascinated afterwards to hear, hear uh, what you say. Um, and then you've also got a 99 uh, Roti Sham Chambata. You know, that's a vintage that's never really closed down and gone tight and ugly, but nor has it finish maturing, I don't think. Um, long, long time ahead of it. Um, 
a good sunny summer, big crop. For some critics, they feel the crop was a tiny bit too big, but I don't really ever find any dilution in them. So I think that should be uh, rather exciting. Um, so what I might suggest is um, if you want to maybe serve at least the O2s, uh, I'll stay with you for those and then leave you in peace to enjoy your uh, dinner with the rest of the wines. Um, I don't know if that works from the service point of view. Otherwise, do you have any more questions you'd like to ask about the wines we've tasted so far or Sean, Sean Bataille in general? Jasper, has, has the style of um, Côte de Gaulle and like Boti also changed, like, you know, in recent vintages? Because like, you know, so, so we have, Denise is like, you know, 2016, but we don't have yeah. like, you know, more vintage of the old ones. No, Roti has not changed. Uh, obviously, you know, richer, hotter vintages may have, may have slightly changed things, but there has been no intention of change. And at Claude Dugas, I would say it was evolution with the um, new generation, um, but not, not a revolution of any sort. They are still being made broadly in the same style, um, but I think possibly with slightly more generosity of fruit and, and slightly less extraction. Um, but no, the, 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 there's no sea change uh, going on at all. Um, maybe I'd just run down some other people whose Sham Sham I like very much indeed. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you have got them. You've got um, Peromino. Um, Reboso may be becoming interesting because there there's been a complete change of generation and half ownership. Now half owned by the um, by Martin Buig. Uh, and uh, since 18, well, probably 19 would be the first genuinely new vintage, uh, they're becoming interesting. Domain Arlo, A-R-L-A-U-D in Maurice saint -Denis, I think make uh, lovely wines. Um, I'm just scrolling down. Obviously Domain Le Vougeret, theirs are in Mazoyer, but they're really old vines. And uh, we've got a, a Vougeret uh, event coming up on the 5th of October. Uh, Dujac, I love, uh, obviously that's almost entirely a uh, whole bunch, as indeed, um, uh, Vougere is very much a uh, whole cluster, whole bunch. Uh, so that will be a different style. Uh, Arno Morte, under his own label rather than the Denny Morte label, uh, is very impressive. Duroche, but it's it's a small oh, vineyard. It's, well, for them, it's a big vineyard. It's 0.41, but uh, still not very much. Um, those would be some of the ones I would particularly look out for. Jasper, the O2s have all just been oh, for everyone. You have them, and how are they? I love the best day on the nose. I'm tasting yeah. what well, beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. beautiful on the nose. Okay. Okay. It, it's actually a vintage of his that I've drunk a lot of because I absolutely love it. I haven't quite run out yet, fortunately, um, um, but it's just been gorgeous all the way through. This is a vintage which I've always been very keen on without claiming it to be a great vintage. Um, I used to describe it as sort of an eight out of 10 vintage, but I really like all those eight points. Whereas you can have some others which are higher rated, but, um, but you're not quite personally so attuned to them. But I do like yeah. O2. Um, isn't that what we really want? And I suspect has been missing a little bit from many of the ones oh, yeah. so far, but you just want that ethereal perfume the second it's poured. I mean, it's always wonderful during a tasting when you have that moment of real excitement at some point. And it sounds like it's there. Oh, that's good to know. Look, unless there's another question, I think I will leave you to enjoy that wine and the, the rest of the tasting and your food. Uh, and I shall go off and get myself vaccinated. But uh, it's been a great pleasure to be with you again. And we have a big program which Michael has put together for uh, October, November, December. And uh, uh, I look forward to joining you again, and maybe next year in real life. Hope so. Thank, Thank you, Jasper. Thank you, Jasper. Thank you. Okay, Thanks, everybody. Bye. Enjoy. Bye. 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 Bye.